Welcome everyone to our May 2023 edition of AZ Bio Peers. Today we're talking about advocacy and why advocacy matters. Advocacy covers a broad range. Okay? It's not just politics. It's speaking for your neighbors. It's speaking for patients. It's speaking for the things that are important to you and your family. And it's working with and building relationships with the people that affect the public policy that can affect the issues that matter to you. So with that, I'm, I'm going to kick us off this morning by introducing our, letting our fabulous panel introduce themselves. And um, as we get started, Michelle, do you want to kick us off? Great. Thanks so much, Joan, and thank you for having me here. Um, I look forward to the conversation. So my name is Michelle Oshman. I am the Vice President for External Affairs at BIO, uh, where I lead patient advocacy. Um, and I also lead the Council for State Bioscience Associations, which AZ Bio is a member of. Um, we have 48 state associations across 46 states. Um, California uh, being the exception and uh, having an extra. Um, and we really do uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm an Arizona native, so uh, Joan and AZ Bio have a very special place in my heart. Um, and, uh, you know, Bio, as you, as I'm sure you know, is a, is a bio industry association. We represent um, not only health, but we represent across agriculture as well as sustainability. But the majority of our work is in health. Great. Bobby, you're up. Great. Thanks, Joan. Thanks for having me today. Uh, so I'm Bobby Patrick. I lead state affairs for AdverMed, in addition to our alliance partners work and our equivalent to uh, the CSBA, uh, we call it the State Medical Technology Alliance or SMTA. Uh, I also, I well, I'm not a native Arizonan. I did previously work at a sister organization to AZ Bio in Minnesota, Medical Alley Association. Mm -hmm. I got to know Joan a bit there as well. <clears throat> so really appreciate the opportunity to be here today, talk about Adam and our work and, and interact with the other panelists. So thank you. Terrific, thank you so much. And bringing it home to Arizona, Julie. Hi, good morning, everyone. Julie Hoffman, and I am Chair of Advocacy for American Diabetes Association, Arizona. I also serve on the Leadership Council of the Arizona Diabetes Coalition. Uh, co-chair of Voice of the Patient for AZ Bio. Really excited about that and have uh, participated myself and as has my daughter, who is the entire reason that I am a patient advocate and now, after many decades, a uh, patient advocacy professional and policy advisor, consultant, you name it, I wear a lot of hats, but I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and share patient stories and how we can engage together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. So, so Bobby, you know, I, I mentioned that advocacy can take many forms. So give me a little feeling for how AdvaMed serves as an advocate. Certainly, certainly. So <clears throat> AdvaMed works, uh, we have uh, advocacy on three levels. We have the, our global, our federal and our state work. And we really look to uh, leverage the innovations that our members are driving in order to help tell the story of MedTech and work on behalf of policies that benefit patients at all three levels of, uh, of, the, of advocacy that we work on. So <clears throat> as an example, uh, you know, at the state level, we work really closely with uh, Alliance partners and our our state affiliates on um, uh, legislation that will advance access for patients to biomarkers that you know are going to help advance that care for a number of disease states, cancer uh, into Alzheimer's, which they just uh, which is advancing rapidly, and then Parkinson's as well. Uh, so that's really exciting. And then at the at the federal level too, we work closely with our uh, our alliance partners, and again with you know, other organizations around Washington, D.C., but also around the country to elevate the work uh, that our, our members are doing to push forward policies that, uh, that can drive not only patient access, but also in, in improve the reach of industry in various parts of the country through economic growth, through research, and, and other types of innovations. So we, we really look to involve 
as many parties as we can that are, that touch uh, not only the, the work that we do, but also in with the patients. So we talk to the hospitals, we talk to uh, the physicians as well. So really it's, it's a broad-based effort that we look to collaborate on that advocacy with uh, and, and with the focus on how can we help bring additional innovations to patients, make sure that they have that access so we can drive the outcomes for them uh, across the board. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. And um, Michelle, you know, mm -hmm. bio and Avamed work very closely together on a lot of issues. Um, but from bio's perspective and your, your, your own role, give me mm -hmm. a kind of a feel. Sure. So we, we similarly advocate at the international, the federal, and the state level. Uh, most of my work is at the federal level, so I'll lean a little bit more into that, um, knowing that Bobby is a, is a state expert, as are the rest of you all. Um, so really, uh, as a trade association with you know, 900 health-focused member companies, you know, we have a lot of um, companies across the spectrum, whether it's, it's, you know, one scientist who's just incorporated or, you know, a, a large multinational uh, biopharmaceutical company as members. But our policy that, and how we select the policy issues really is, um, certainly our board has influence on that. We also have a very, very strong federal affairs team, and they're constantly monitoring what's happening on the Hill and, um, you know, every uh, opportunity that we have. Um, but, but a lot of our true nitty gritty policy development happens in committee and com and that's a you know we have a weekly policy committee meeting of the policy folks at, at any and all of our member companies who care to join and and that's where we hashed out our 74 page ira response letter um that's where we are currently hashing out the mp um hpms letter and so those kinds of um you know, and and the I would say that the policy team here at Bio is really our think tank, right? They are deep experts. Um, I know enough to be dangerous, but enough to really communicate it out to our our third party partners, which really is the team that I lead here. Um, and I sit with our federal affairs folks, so we um, have our finger on the pulse of everything that's happening. So we work in tandem with our member companies, and we we work uh, to represent them. Um, I'm happy to go into some of those specific issues if there's interest, um, but I'll, I'll let you I'll let you decide that, Joan. But well, I would say that you know federally, um, most folks could could guess what those are, and and those priorities are really IRA, IRA, and IRA. So um, <laughs> how we're addressing that, how we're mitigating, and how we're representing our companies effectively to ensure that pipeline of innovation um, and R and D continues to be pulled through um, in the face of some significant challenges right now. Great, thanks, Michelle. And so, Julie, as a patient advocate, um, Bobby and Michelle get paid for what they do. Okay, you're doing it out of love. So, help me understand, as a patient advocate, how do you work with the community to raise awareness on those issues, especially when you don't have a big budget? Right, it's that part is really difficult because um, it's one of those things where. Everybody wants to engage with you. People want to talk with you and do the work, but then um, the reciprocation on the end is the patients are often um, hit with a lot of access issues and cost issues, and then have to also um, pay their way to be a patient advocate and kind of do the work for other people. So that's something that I'm really proud to see that um, industry is coming around, a lot of different organizations are realizing that extra burden that is put on patients. But how I've always chosen to engage with people in the community, different organizations, policymakers, you name it, is being vulnerable, number one, which is just a, a euphemism for being real and, and telling your stories. And I always lead and listen with discernment, uh, empathy, and my personal lived experiences that may not exactly mirror someone else's or in a similar, in a different disease. My daughter was diagnosed with type one diabetes when she was a year and a half old. Um, Humalog was a brand new insulin to the market at that time. And she's now 27, almost 27 and a med student. And so she's also got four autoimmune diseases. So over that period of time, 
um, I've seen so many things change and, and the patient access to the innovation, because we're always still hoping for a cure, right? Um, those access issues have changed over time and they are universal. And so um, we're able to find uh, alliances and like-minded thinking with policymakers, um, micro organizations that are in the community, faith-based organizations, medical professionals, industry policymakers, you name it. That vulnerability and willingness to be um, very kind of raw at times um, really helps us to be able to affect policy. And, Julia, and I think that voice is so credible, whether you're at the State House or on Capitol Hill, like you were last week, that the patient voice resonates. And I think yeah. that that's why it is so important that we we um, work together. And, um, you know, I know Joan had indicated, you know, Bobby and I do this. I, I'm lucky enough that the job that I get paid to do is actually one that I love. It never feels yeah. like work, um, which I'm very fortunate. And it was the same when I was at Lilly as Julie and I were chatting earlier. But um, but it is, it, yeah, I've always been so impressed. I've worked in patient advocacy for 15 of my 18 years at Lilly and and again for the past three years and just the passion that patient advocates bring to the table, whether they're family members or, um, you know, healthcare providers who've turned uh, and kind of focus their careers in advocacy. It's wonderful with me. Thanks. And, and Nate, I know you've worked a lot with your patient groups, both in Minnesota, uh, when you were there, because I know Medical Alley is very, very strong in that area, as well as, you know, really engaged at AdvoMed to bring that strength to AdvoMed. Um, how does AdvoMed work with patients? Yeah, that's a great question. And and Julie, that was that was really helpful. I, I you know, for us, it's it's a lot about building that relationship, understanding, you know, what how uh, the patients within those disease states are are having issues accessing our technologies or innovations, what we can do to help, uh, how we can work together at the various levels of government, because there's different challenges at each space, how and how we can work with them where they are to elevate their voices with uh, with policymakers. Because, it, you know, we want to be able to help move forward the things that are helpful to patients. Um, but we can't do that without having their voices there. So how can we help position them? And and I think, you know, Julie raised some uh, issues that for, for challenges that for, for patients in doing that. And I think that she's right. Industry is is trying to step up and be able to help make that happen. And, and we look forward to doing that. So AdvoMed, for, for us, it's really about building that relationship, building that rapport, and making sure that we're in tune with what the patients are looking for and that we're, that we're helping them achieve that rather than just trying to achieve where we think they need to be, so. Uh, and Julie mentioned that um, she is co-chair of Voice of the Patient. So every year during Arizona Bioscience Week, um, one of our, my favorite events is Voice of the Patient. And that is an event where the only people that speak are patients. And we as industry and as healthcare um, professionals listen and hopefully act on what they tell us. So um, it, it's very, very important. And Julie, you know, I remember um, we had a basketball game a few months ago. Um, <laughs> and you um, had a gentleman that came in and spoke to us at the law school before a basketball game. You want to talk about that? Oh, sure. So, uh anticipating a, um, and a successful um, PBM bill that passed the legislature this year and the governor signed um, was not as, uh, did not have as many regulatory teeth as we first intended, but still nonetheless um, for patients, it was a complete um, win and a step in the right direction. And so I knew that uh, Mark Cuban's uh, Dallas Mavericks played the Suns on a Thursday night. And um, I, no joke, cold emailed him, explained to him what we were doing in patient advocacy and the collaborative nature of our work, with, working with different patient organizations, physicians, um, pharmacists, um, just all kinds of different groups. And knowing that he was doing his cost plus drugs, um, 
prescription or his pharmacy, um, he said, I'm in, I'll be there. Tell me where, tell me when. We made it easy. We were five minutes from the arena. He showed up early, stayed late, took selfies with everyone. And really, um, we had representatives of some national organizations, law students, pharmacy students, medical students, and then all kinds of patient advocates, um, several legislators, uh, lobbyists, you name it, we were all there. And what an engaging time and um, really brought us together as patient advocates from all different um, walks of life and helped us get that bill passed. And here come my landscapers. So Joan, back. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Julie. That, that was a really great transition to bringing um, things and, and also, you know, shining the light on, you get those unexpected things that pop up in the middle of your advocacy. Um, so, you know, when we look at the things that are important and, and I'll kick off and I'm going to ask all of our patients to, or our panelists to share a couple of the key issues that they are. But here at the state level, um, you know, our work with our advocacy community whether that is the, um, you know, the innovator companies that have lobbyists or the patient advocacy groups that we work so closely with. Um, you know, Arizona has some of the best public policy for patients and patient access in the entire country. And Bobby mentioned earlier biomarkers. Arizona was the second state to pass biomarker access legislation and, in my personal opinion, has the best coverage for patients anywhere. And for those of you that are not familiar, what it means in Arizona is that um, if a patient has a condition that requires a biomarker test and their doctor feels that this test is necessary and the medical documentation is there either through coverage paths that already exist at, at the federal level, FDA approval, or a body of medical literature that shows that this is a standard of care. If that is the case, then their insurance has to cover it. If they are in the Medicaid system, in the small group, you know, the, the um, Affordable Care Act program, private, small group, and, and other programs. It doesn't impact ERISA plans, so those are those big company employers, and it doesn't impact Medicare, although a lot of these tests are covered by Medicare. Um, now, that means that Arizona's great work in advocacy now shifts to the federal level. So Arizonans are talking to their congressional leaders in the House of Representatives and in the Senate and sharing how important this new legislation is for patients in Arizona and encouraging them to take steps forward to make it available for people everywhere on those programs that the federal government governs, um, ERISA being a big one because they can make that change in ERISA and it doesn't cost the federal government any money. That's the perfect solution. So when you have those conversations, you bring in the patient voice, you bring in what's happening in your state, and you also you know, need to show how you can build a solution that will work for people, because that is a big challenge as we all wait to see if the federal government will figure out how to deal with the debt ceiling this week. So as we go through this process, those are important, but you know, biomarkers isn't the only thing that Arizona's policy coalition and advocacy groups have succeeded in making law. Um, Arizona has um, protections for patients relative to programs like step therapy. Um, copay accumulators are not legal in Arizona on Arizona health plans. Um, as we go forward, we continue to look at how we can make it easier for doctors um, by, autom by you know, standardizing various form sets, making sure that they have what they need. And as, as Julie said, um, starting to put registration requirements on PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers, because before this law went into effect, they didn't even have to register in Arizona. So um, these are steps when we all work together. Now, we've had phenomenal successes. And one of the huge successes 
was the creation of the Arizona Health Innovation Trust Fund, which went from an idea in the September of 2021 20, um, to law in 2022. It was a huge step. And it was also a step that was unprecedentedly fast. Mm. Policy doesn't usually move fast. Michelle, why does it take so long? At the federal level? Uh, well, um, at every level, but especially at the federal level. Sure, um, I'm happy to speak to that. I think um, one of the, the there obviously the process is uh, extensive. There are so many avenues in, um, but you also have to have that trifecta or at least the perfect, a, a, a reasonable balance such that you can get laws passed. If you have, you know, a split majority between the House and, and the Senate, um, and you know that you're not going to, you know, if it's, you know, if, it's, if you have, um, you know, the Republicans in in the in charge of one body and, and Dems in the other, and then a white a White House that's one or the other. It's really, really hard to get big things across the finish line. I mean, we saw last year with PDUFA, which is the every five year renewal essentially of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. It's what funds FDA to review drug applications. Um, you know, there was a lot of hemming and hawing and what would be attached and what wouldn't. And the only way, um, ultimately, it was reauthorized as part of a package and completely clean. Usually, um, there are lots of things added, we call that ornaments on a Christmas tree. The Christmas tree this year will be PAPA, the prescription, uh, excuse me, the pandemic and all hazards um, uh, funding, farm bill. It, you know, you look for moving vehicles, you, you, you find ways to attach um your interests your your legislation to it um you hope that it's mod if it's bipartisan enough to make it make it through um at the end of the day i think we saw what happened at the health committee uh <clears throat> with uh sanders um and cassidy last week you know that that uh two weeks ago um even even the most um i think uh you know, hallowed halls of Congress, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of gridlock. And, um, you know, I could give you sort of a psychosocial review of why that is. And, and folk used to actually like each other on the Hill and, and they pretty much, um, there's a lot less of that now, but there's also, I think, um, uh, as an economist, I'm sure you can appreciate Joan, the Congressional Budget Office will score anything. So um, the biomarker uh, win that you all you all had, I guarantee you CBO is going to score that, even if it, it it shouldn't cost the government anything, but they'll find a way to make sure it costs, like, or to report that it costs something, and then that you have that pay for. And so that process takes forever. Um, the patient community right now has been really, really excited about the Help Copays Act, which um, really addresses some of the, the PBM misdeeds, if you will, um, and, and give uh, some relief to the patients. But one thing that's not in the COPE, um, Help Copays Act is rebate pass through to the patient. And, and the reason that that's not in there right now is just because the score would be enormous. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate um, actually my friends in the diabetes community um, from the Diabetes Leadership Council and others say, you know, this shouldn't cost the government anything um, to pass, re you know, in the private sector rebates to the patient. But um, when you really get down to the actuarial tables, it, 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 it does cost the government because it's, it's money that comes out of the sort of um, discretionary funding in, in each family's pocketbook, that kind of thing. And so you, you get into a lot of process and a lot of evaluation um, and then a lot of arguing. So um, across the aisle and and more. So I, I'm not giving you a very, um, none of those answers are ideal. I wish I could say, well, it, it's, it takes a long time because of X, Y, Z, um, but it also takes a lot of time to move public opinion. And I think that um, one of the significant challenges we face in in our industry, um, and you would think that you know the industry that saved millions of lives during the COVID pandemic. I lost my mom to COVID early in the pandemic. Um, would be the biotech and biopharmaceutical industry would realize some kind of um, uh, you know reputational benefit. And in fact, we we saw a tiny bump, um, but uh, we still unfortunately have a very um, 
you know, they're quite disparaged in, in terms of public opinion and, and that's unfortunate as well. And that can make the make it that much harder to get your issues across. So Bobby, um, you know, Michelle talked about the Christmas tree, right? And you get these large pieces of legislation that are intended to do good. Mm. And then you get unintended consequences that come out of pieces of those legislation. And, you know, probably the, the case that I use to explain this to people on what it takes to get a fix is the medical device tax. Because the Affordable Care Act, you know, very huge piece of legislation. Um, one of those pay fors that Michelle mentioned was um, a tax on medical device innovation as an excise tax. So off the top, not on profit. And um, as soon as that went into effect, we started to see ripples. And Bobby and I, you and I both lived through it at the state level as we were trying to get it repealed. Um, and now, um, you know, data was what made the difference, right? We built up the data, we made the case, we showed the harm from this unintended consequence. And then, you know, in the case of the medical device tax, um, it was suspended, 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 repeal, right? After over a, a long number of years. Um, but right now, our companies are dealing with another major tax issue um, relative to R&D expensing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly, yeah. And, and I, I, I like that you introed that with the, the medical device tax. You know, I think the what the what enabled that su the success was unfortunately the short period of time when the medical device tax was actually being implemented, right? It was sort of delayed at the beginning and then it clicked on and then it was suspended again. And what what that that gap when it was actually implemented showed was there was a real impact, right? Industry wasn't just uh, chicken little, oh no, we don't wanna pay a tax. It was no, this actually is gonna impact innovation. It's gonna impact patient access to new medical technology. It's gonna impact jobs. And it gave that that very direct uh, uh, piece of information. So when we came back around for repeal, we could point to that and, and that that bolstered the new data that we were showing from firms as we were asking them, hey, what are you, how are you going to respond if this clicks back on? And they said, well, we're going to cut jobs and we're going to have to cut R&D. And it's like, you know what, they're not just saying that because they don't want to do it. It's a real result because we could look before. So as unfortunate as that was, it did allow that. And I think the R&D is the same way, right? And the, the interesting thing about R&D is that I think very similar to the medical device tax, and, and Michelle will agree with this, I think on the bio side, is it impacts large and small companies, right? It isn't just one size, one or the other, it's everybody. It may impact them in different ways and in different parts of their organization, but certainly in bringing forward those innovations for patients, it's, it's, changing how companies or how uh, organizations are able to invest in that function. And so being able to show, hey, this is how we were investing in R&D before, and this is the impact that it's having after. And, it, and even though it does appeal to, even though it does cross the large and small company barrier, really the, the stories that impact the most and because of their, um, uh, their, their the appeal of small businesses, right? Are the newer and the emerging companies and showing, hey, mm -hmm. if if this isn't fixed, we're not, we may not exist. It isn't, it, it isn't just like we might not be able to bring forward the next innovation or it might be delayed a few years, which is also not great in and of itself, but we may lose a whole series of innovations full stop if okay. if, if these things aren't uh, or a remedy to to ensure that can move forward. So I think, Joan, to, to your question, it's a long way of answering your question. Uh, I think that uh, that's the unintended consequence, right? Yeah. I, I think you know it is the loss of of innovation, the loss of companies, and the loss yeah. of that patient facing uh, uh, solutions for disease states uh, in total, not just yeah. the delay. So. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the mechanics of the policy issue are um, actually for a, for a DC policy issue. It's it's not that it's it's not that complex. It's not like trying to explain spread pricing and PBMs and negotiation of 
you know, contracting. Really, at the end of the day, this was something the previous presidential administration enacted. It was a forced amortization of your expensing on R&D over five years. So a tiny startup company who may have, you know, done, uh, you know, had no revenue done only, you know, they've raised their funds, but they are just spending money on R&D. They can't expense that, you know, on April 15th of this year, because it came into effect last year, they were not able to expense 100% of their R&D expenditure. They could only expense 20% with the other 20, you know, the other increments over five years for U.S. investment. If it was overseas, it had to be amortized over 15 years. Um, and, and the I thought was, I think the thought was to bring jobs back to the states but in fact what it's done um we certainly have um, as i mentioned about 80 percent of bios member companies have nothing on the market they're in that capital formation and early stage investment um we have talked to multiple companies whose tax bill was far far exceeded you know the, their resources to be able to fund and frankly um you know i think a lot of folks in washington thought this would be fixed it'll be fixed this tax issue yeah. will be fixed before the next, you know, uh, you know, April 15th is my birthday, so I'm always very conscious of when tax day is, but it'll be fixed before next April. Well, it wasn't, um, you know, the, the, you know, certainly if it does get addressed, there would be, you know, some kind of a, a rollback so folks will get their dollars back, but who knows if those companies will still be in existence at that point in time. So a uh, very significant issue. The good news is, um, uh, that uh, Senator uh, Young from Indiana and Senator Hassan, you know, they introduced a bill uh, to address this issue. Um, it, uh, it, you know, it's been met favorably. Certainly, um, the state associations were instrumental in in sharing um, a sign-on letter that CSBA had done, but also advocating during Advomed Seal Day, which was just a couple weeks before ours, um, on the issue. So that's exciting. There's a House bill now, so we do hope that this will be um, something that gets addressed. But but to any of you, uh, you know, on the line who represent small companies, this truly is an existential threat. I mean, large companies certainly as well, but um, the that sort of it the, it chills that entrepreneurial um, sort of effort that so many people, you know, that's that's what they do, right? They're entrepreneurs. They want to be, uh, you know, part of flagship pioneering or any of these sort of incubator houses. So um, it's a real challenge, and and I think. One of the things I have to really give Joan and her team a huge amount of credit for, um, and all of our state associations, is uh, the the voice of the coalition across all the state associations. That you know, the state associations represent through grassroots, right? All of you are members of AZ Bio, and you you look to Joan for her leadership and and on policy issues that are critically important. Um, and we have that replicated, you know, in 48 organizations across the country. And when um, you all come together and support a letter, which um, you hand delivered to the Hill um, on our Hill Day, mm -hmm. it's really, really powerful. And so um, we got a lot of really positive feedback from um, and thanks from uh, the many co-sponsors of that bill on the Senate side. And I know many of you have shared that letter with your um, uh, House House colleagues as well. So there's uh, there may be hope on the horizon for this particular issue. I hate, I will knock on wood because I don't want to jinx it, but um, it's uh, few few and far between. Do we see do we see wins on this kind of you know on any policy issue? But we really are hoping on this one. Well, and it's you know it's interesting. Um, as I had conversations in. You know, one of the benefits of, of having been, um, you know, working um, to to share information with our um, elected leaders in Washington D.C. for you know decades is that we know each other and we can have mm -hmm. conversations. And um, and because of that, you know, one of the things they shared with me is that every innovation industry, not just ours, every innovation in the industry has been impacted from automotive to health and, and wellness to industrial, aerospace, defense. If you are innovating, you are doing research and development and this has had a major impact. So the voice is very loud on this one. Another place where voices are really loud is patients can't pay for their medicine. And Julie, 
you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we had some really big wins for patients. Um, and I know you worked really hard on that. Don't forget you're on mute. And um, on the other side of it, um, the patients are worried about some things in the Inflation Reduction Act. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I think uh, one of the things, and I'll, I'll go back 25 years when my daughter was first diagnosed with uh, type 1, was, oh, don't worry about it. There'll be a cure in five years. And I know that probably every single person on this call yep. um, has heard that from a patient, and if not themselves, because I know many people in this field are patient advocates themselves. Um, so I've renewed that five-year contract um, with our creator five, year, uh, five different times now, and I'm getting ready to go on my sixth uh, iteration of that. But I, I think for patients, the, as we've moved along as a family over time, still hoping for a cure, appreciating innovations and devices and things that have really given us spontaneity in our life. It's allowed my daughter to um, excel in school and like I said before, to be a med student. But the idea that the struggles that we have already had with getting access to what is on the market now, um, the, the onerous prior authorizations, um, the duplicative um, administrative burden that's placed on patients and pharmacists and physicians. Um, it's, it, it's like there are parallel universes that industry is in one, medical practice is in one, the PBMs are in one, patients are in one. But ultimately, we cannot get access to any innovations, um, whether that's device, medications, or just new, new treatments without all working together. And um, that's certainly one of my priorities. And um, from a policy issue, um, I think all of us can realize, and I'm certainly Joan has, has led the way with AZ Bio, but um, you know, things like access to care have to do with um, the time it takes to get an appointment, um, the time it takes to see a specialist, um, mm -hmm. graduate medical education. And these are all separate policy issues at, at state capitals and then federally too. Um, access to pharmacies here in Phoenix, or I mean, Arizona, um, Kroger is going through with a merger with Safeway and Albertsons. And those are our big three grocery stores. And as they consolidate, we're gonna leave a lot of people without access to a neighborhood pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And so that's not something that I've seen even in the newspaper about this issue. And it's all about groceries. Well, no, to me, it's about pharmacies too. Those are vaccinations, uh, thousands that were done um, in, in grocery stores across Arizona, many in rural communities. So um, it, it's a huge problem, Joan. And again, it's one of those things where we have to work together. We're all stakeholders um, and we all deserve a seat at the table. And I, I appreciate everything that you've done for patients. Thank you, Julie. And Michelle, we can't wrap up this part of the program without talking about the elephant in the room. So the Which inflation, one? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually the Inflation Reduction Act created a herd of elephants. Um, and we're now just starting to get the data. When I was in DC, I had the opportunity to share with our delegation um, the input from a survey that was done by one of our AZ Bio board members, who is a fundraising small molecule um, CEO right now. And um, he put out on LinkedIn, when I was getting ready to leave to go to DC, oh, he just waved at me. Um, he um, put on LinkedIn just before I was getting ready to go to DC, um, you know, how is this impacting you? By the time I landed and saw Michelle on that Monday, there were over a hundred responses from CEOs, venture capitalists, large companies, small companies, patient groups, all saying, oh my goodness, this is already having an impact. 
Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to have to keep gathering that data because that's the story that has to be told. But Michelle, you know, a, a lot of times people say, well, the Inflation Reduction Act was good. It helped patients, which it did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially as, as some of you know, I am 62 going on 63 and I'm, Medicare is, is in my future, not so distantly. Um, you know, so things that impact Medicare actually do impact me. Mm-hmm. But I also am worried that as I get older, you know, central nervous system diseases where medicines need to cross the blood-brain barrier, um, biologics don't usually do really well there. That's small molecules. But how is the IRA discouraging R&D in a small molecule space? I think it's having an effect across the board. Um, it, it is unique in the the small molecule space because the you know it, you know if you're talking about an you know a pill, right? Um, you're not you may not necessarily meet that threshold for negotiation based on the cost of the you know the cost of that individual medicine. You'll you'll hit that from volume, right? So the incentive now to create you know a a Part D medication that is for a chronic disease is somewhat limited. You, you almost don't want to have that blockbuster because that puts you into a government negotiation program. And, and when we say negotiation, it's not a negotiation, it's, it's, got, it's government price setting. Because if you don't participate, if you decide I'm not gonna negotiate things, you pay a 90% fee. So that's not like it's really um, optional. Um, before I go kind of too far into the, the side effects, if you will, of the IRA, I want to go back to um, uh, Julie's uh, just comments and really that it was the diabetes community um, and a number of uh, ADA, former ADA chairs, I don't know if you know Stuart Perry and and uh, and our, our friends out there, at, um, uh, but, you know, truly uh, pushed to have Diabetes medications, insulin in particular, part of first dollar coverage. So meaning that you don't, it's not subject to a deductible because it's a preventive medicine. If you don't have it, you, you know, obviously uh, cannot, cannot sustain. And so they've done a phenomenal job of really educating employers and, and doing a lot of that outreach so that large group employers, the ERISA plans are thinking more about, okay, it may save us money in one arena, but it's going to cost us more in employee, you know, em- employees being out, employees maybe leaving the company because the insurance isn't sufficient to support their um, needs. I bring that up because there's sort of a distally related issue that I'll tie to here in a moment. So when you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, we heard early on in the challenge, El Nylum was very public um, in shutting down you know, a sleeve of their work because of their concerns around IRA. Um, some, it, you know, not all companies have been as outspoken about it, but we're certainly doing research based on, um, uh, you know, the data available and we'll be continuing to do that to really quantify how this is changing pipelines. But it will take some time to really get that data um, over the long term. Um, some of the other pieces within the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, there's there's an orphan drug carve out a little bit, um, and that is you know for your first indication um, for a, a drug deemed orphan uh, indication, uh, you're exempt from negotiation. Um, but it, if you have a second indication for that drug, which is how most rare disease medicines are are developed, is iteratively you know iterative di- uh, uh, indications add on to that first. Um, it, uh, it puts it into peril, and certainly the small biotech exemption um, is something that was, uh, a, you know, a good thing for some companies, but it's so narrowly defined that only a handful of companies really qualify. What we're seeing, though, is the downward pressure, so it, it certainly should be celebrated. The patient out-of-pocket cap in Part D is significant, so $2,000 and the patient advocacy community is working really hard to figure out with CMS how do you smooth that over time? Um, how do you, you know, how do you, how can you, um, you know, best support the the patients in that, you know, until we get to that bridge, it's not going to happen really until 2025. But but what we're seeing in terms of uh, additional downward pressure on patients' affordability um, is is kind of I call it whack-a-mole. So one of those 
the the mold that we whack is PBM, right? I mean, the, the idea of spread pricing and, um, you know, the significant um, uh, sort of profit in that particular industry. If you if you look at the Fortune 100 for the U.S., and you can look it up any day of the week, and I you yep. could do it right now, you'll see in that top 20 are the PBMs, all three of them, the big ones that control 85% of the market. You're not going to see a single pharmaceutical company in that list until you get down to about 56 and it's J&J &J, um, and Pfizer is somewhere in the 70s. My former company is not even in the top 100 and it's a very large company. So um, it's you can see that there's that's an, that is an industry with limited innovation significant profit and limited benefit to the patient. You know, if your drug is on formulary, great, but there's this other mole that we are whacking, which is, I refer to as shark schemes, but alternative funding programs. I, there are lots of different nicer ways to say it, um, but this cottage industry that's popped up in which um, a, a, a new entity, new company will go to a large group employer and say, hey, we can save you a bunch of money on your employee health insurance if you just exclude the following medicines from your formulary. And the employer realizes, oh, wow, that will save me a lot of money. Um, and then what happens with the patients on those medicines is this firm um, shepherds them through a process to get medication, um, essentially forcing manufacturers to put them into patient assistance, free drug, even if the person might make $300,000 a year, they clearly don't qualify um, uh, for that free drug, but uh, there are, their, their methods are rather uh, concerning on, on multiple levels. It's not just that, that um, sort of lasering out a patient from coverage in, in their current plan, um, but it also actually requires that the patient hand over um, their private health information to their employer. And in some cases, we have documentation that the shark schemes are uh, requiring patients to provide sort of a medical power of attorney to allow that, that company that, um, to represent them. Um, and, you know, we are very, very concerned. Um, and, uh, that, you know, I, I did a program on it not long ago. We'll be doing another one, and I'm happy to make sure that I'll uh, Joan is invited, she can share with all of you, but really, truly, um, the growth in this particular industry is very concerning. And, and Gallagher um, reports that about 10% of large group employers employ one of these programs without sometimes even knowing it. Um, and about 30% more have been considering it. So we're working very hard to um, certainly educate the Hill, but um, working with our patient advocacy partners to really be talking to large group employers in particular um, that these schemes are out there and they may provide some upfront savings, but at the end of the day, they're, um, they are forcing patients to give up access um, to, to the treatment that they may have, putting them into this, this no man's, no person's land. Um, and many times the, the, there's, there's almost nothing that can be done for the patient. Um, uh, and because the free drug program is legally not able to provide to them because they are, they have strict parameters in which copay assistance foundations can't support them because by definition to have copay assistance you must have a copay which means you have coverage for the drug um and so we're really uh, quite concerned about this this new phenomenon so those are side effects that um that i don't think anyone really recognize certainly at least on these uh the shark scheme alternative funding programs i think we didn't envision um at least I didn't, um, but uh, but but which are really truly, um, you know, response to that downward pressure is um, a, a lot of uh, a, a lot a lot more pressure on patients and also on the innovator. Julie, and you know the the whole concept, and you and I have have had long conversations on the whole issue of non medical switching and how that impacts patients and. So in my son's case, there was his insurance company did something that was completely legal. Um, his doctor said, you know, this is not in the best interest of the patient. And while they were fighting it out, he landed in the hospital again. And it cost the insurance company way more than they would have saved on that switch. Um, what is the talk in the patient community, Julie, about 
the whole issue of non-medical switching and you know where companies whether they're insurance companies or private payers are making the decision over and above what the patient and the doctor think is the right decision. Well, my family has been uh, vic <laughs> re-victimized over and over again by non-medical switching. And, and one of the scariest things um, from a patient, whether it's your child or um, a spouse or a parent, or any loved one truly, is being at the pharmacy counter going to get your prescription and your copay, you know, you've planned that it's, you know, $50 or whatever, and finding out that it's now $785 because you've been non-medically switched to um, a similar drug, maybe in the same class, but it's now, um, your drug could be excluded on your formulary. And, um, you cannot get a fill for the other drug without a new prescription. So there is, again, like I spoke to earlier, this parallel universe that happens um, and, and the physician's office, the patients, the pharmacists are burdened with double and triple work. And ultimately days go by without um, a patient accessing that medication um, and it's, Something that we often refer to is uh, the non-medical switching is part of you know, practicing medicine without a license. And um, it's just an administrative move. Um, I think from a patient advocacy perspective, I'm not ashamed to say that I used to believe that formularies were therapeutic in nature and that they were somehow benevolent. And they're um, just from my, always there for protection. Um, and I have learned over time that they are shelf space for sale. And so I, a virtual shelf space for sale because it, it changes. Um, I think one of the dangerous things is seeing drugs that are excluded from formularies. And um, I do want to touch quickly also on that non-medical switching on what Michelle was talking about with the patient assistance programs. Um, one thing for everyone on the call to know too is you can go to any number of manufacturers and pull up those applications and a number of them require a soft credit pull. So um, most patients don't know it and they're giving social security numbers and they don't realize that in the fine print they're authorizing a third party vendor who's processing those um, patient assistance program applications to do a soft credit pull. And I know a number of patients who have been denied that based on just simple zip code information of where they lived and the program assumed that they uh, lived in a more, uh, um, a higher income area. Um, they didn't take into consideration that they might be sharing a room with three or four roommates, um, I mean, sharing a house. So um, access to, uh, to drugs is something that Joan knows that I will, um, I will continue doing um, probably forever, so. Thank you, Julie, and, and you, you really have made, a huge voice has made a huge difference in so Thank many you. things. You know, we were talking about, you know, formularies and things like that, and that's not law, that's regulatory. And, um, when we look at the agencies and the regulatory pathways that affect all of the things after the laws get passed, um, you know, those don't get as much attention. And Bobby, you know, we've been spending a lot of time um, talking about ethylene oxide and the, um, you know, I, I, believe me, I, I support the environment. I want to have a safe environment. I want to make sure that people live in safe areas. Um, but I also know that if we go overboard um, on some of our regulations, it can also have a dramatic impact on not just the industry, but on the patients that are waiting for the products the industry creates. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, and Joan, I thought I was going to get out of this without having to talk about ethylene <laughs> oxide, but here we are. So, yeah, Joan, I mean, I think the, the key with ethylene oxide, right, is it's it's used to sterilize half of all medical devices. Many of those have no alternative, and, and industry is working with the FDA to develop that. Uh, 
But until that time, uh, we need to use that to make sure that patients have access to a wide variety of devices and from pacemakers and syringes to IV bags, you know, uh, orthotic devices across the board, surgical kits, uh, you know, nearly every surgical kit or a high percentage of surgical kits in this country are sterilized using ethylene oxide. Um, so, you know, the reality is it's, it can, it can be used uh, in a way that minimizes its impact and that, you know, it doesn't add an appreciable amount to the ambient air where ETO already exists endogenously. So, you know, I think while industry will continue to work to reduce its emissions, and that's something that we're working with the EPA on right now, until there is an alternative, this is something that we need to continue using in order to uh, ensure that patients have access to uh, medical technology. And we're working with the EPA on that. And, and uh, that will be uh, an interesting few months uh, as they finalize that regulation. Well, and I, the, e the EPA had not come out with its list publicly for a long time on or updated the list as far as who, who was in good standing and who was on the question mark or on the naughty list. And I was I was absolutely thrilled when the new report came out, and no one in Arizona was on the naughty list. So I was like, "Yes, Christmas came early." Yeah. yeah. So, um, so as we're starting to wrap things up, I, first of all, I want to really thank our panelists because they were amazing, and that we were able to cover so much ground in in just an hour. But I do want to give them each an opportunity for a brief closing thought. Michelle, you kicked us off with bring us home. Um, so, you know, I, I think that probably the most important takeaway uh, for everyone, you know, and I have to really thank Julie for being part of this uh, and, and really sharing that patient voice is that the patient voice matters, right? At the end of the day, the patient voice is a credible voice on Capitol Hill with regulatory agencies um, and in and, and advocating uh, for therapies uh, and treatments to be developed. And so we really, I think I have the good fortune of working with patient advocates every day. And, you know, my job is to really make sure that our companies are thinking about that as well. Not only on the policy side, but we didn't get into it in this conversation, because, it's, it, but it, you know, really on the drug development side, if you're, if you are a small biotech um, and you're thinking about, you know, developing a treatment for you know, X, Y, Z, really look to the patient experts and the, and the you know, patient advocacy community to identify folks early on who can really help you along that journey. Um, he, understanding the patient experience is really, really important. So um, I also want to acknowledge, I know that uh, uh, your colleague Jim Hart had asked, or, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, um, asked a question about the efforts to bring um, API active pharmaceutical ingredient um, manufacture back to the U.S. And I committed to get an answer and I'll send that to you, Joan, so you can share. Um, you. But yeah, my takeaway is really uh, embrace the voice of the patient and be, do so thoughtfully and with respect and consider it a, a journey that you're on hand in hand. Awesome. Thank you. And Bobby? Yeah, thanks, Joan, and appreciate the opportunity. And, and I'll just add, you know, the the <clears throat> the uh, the subject of this was, uh, you know, advocating that advocacy that matters and, and the different forms of advocacy. And, and, and there are many different forms and, and many different approaches to take, but really, you know, we're focused on how we can deliver policy initiatives that matter for patients. And that's always going to be the guiding focus of uh, AdvaMed and our members. And we look forward to continuing to work with Julie and others uh, to continue doing that in the coming years. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. And Julie? Well, thank you everyone for being here today and uh, Joan for convening us all together on this important topic and very timely as our uh, state legislative session winds down. And, um, you know, I, I have a, a graphic that I often use in, in talks that just simply says advocacy in action and it's kind of like a little spoke and wheel um, to put yourself um, whatever you're advocating, you want to give yourself an advantage, you want to bring attention to um, your priorities, you want to build alliances, you want to be aware of what else is in the community, who are policymakers, who you need to engage with. You also need to be aware, beware of organizations that may sound very patient friendly, but are in what we call in advocacy astroturf organizations versus grassroots. So they're fake grass. They're meant to um, confuse 
um, policymakers and others in the community. And lastly, again, be authentic. That kind of takes it back to my opening statement. Um, and I would ask everyone on the call to engage more with AZ Bio. Um, Joan does an incredible job of putting together government affairs um, program and priorities and a call every month. And you can actually hear the voice of the patient every month on those calls. So um, thank you, Bobby and Michelle. This has been a pleasure sharing the, this time with you. And again, um, you know, to all of our um, AZ Bio members who work with us um, at the legislature and talking with our patient groups, but more importantly, working on the treatments, cures, um, that will make life better for all of us. Because if you look at our lifespan, all of us at one time or another will be a patient. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you to our amazing panel. Um, we are going to be um, broadcasting more updates next month and we're really excited to be heading to the bio international convention in june where we'll see so many of our friends so thank you everyone have a great end of the month and uh, we'll see you soon <laughs>